Yeah, you know what, that's what happens. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Recruiters Hangout. Thank you for joining us, if there's anyone out there. Sorry we're starting uh, slightly late today. Um, we have uh, Jorgen Sundberg joining us today to talk about how content marketing can help recruiters. Uh, Jorgen's a former director at Red Commerce, um, one of the uh, world's leading uh, SAT recruitment agencies. Uh, he is founder of the Undercover Recruiter blog. Uh, if any of you don't uh, read or follow that, as well worth a look at. And uh, he runs his own social media agency, Link Humans. Um, We've also got Mark Stevens from the F10 group, uh, Tira, who's uh, one of our co-hosts, and Alan Whitford from uh, Tech, uh, who will be hosting today, asking the questions, keeping us all in line. Uh, Louise can't uh, keep an on hashtag today, so I'm doing that. My name is Louis from Colleague Software. The hashtag is Rec Hangout. Uh, please uh, feel free to ask any questions, comment. I'll pass them on and. Um, We've got the uh, event page as well, which you're welcome to post to. Um, thank you. I'll pass it over to you, Alan. Thanks very much, Louis. Uh, welcome, everybody, and welcome, Jorgen, um, for joining us. Uh, as I've said in some of the tweets that we've put out there, we've we, uh, decided you're in the, the hot seat today um, mm -hmm. and talking about content marketing. And uh, I, guess, I, I guess the first thing I would ask you, Jorgen, is, is, Jorgen, is what do you mean by content marketing? Well, um, I suppose I mean marketing by uh, either creating or curating content, putting putting uh, information out there, um, hopefully being perceived as someone has something good to say, and by that uh, achieving some, some branding, awareness, hopefully some consideration, hopefully uh, that would lead to new relationships and, and more business. So mightn't we say just by definition, if we're using social media or blogging or other tools um, or even job advertising, that we are already, by definition, using content to be marketing? Yeah, I think everything you put out is, is in effect, content. Even just a, a short tweet it is, is a piece of content. This uh, Google Hangout today, that's uh, what I would call more long-form content. Uh, yeah. And it takes a bit longer than writing a, a tweet. So there are lots of different ways of doing content marketing. But yeah, in a way, just by, by being out on social media, you are already doing it. So does it require a, a different skill set? Because I think if we talked about the, the origination of job boards, we always talked about those as just being content platforms. Or, you know, Job boards are publishing platforms. We either publish candidates or we publish jobs. Um, but what we've seen over the years is one of the challenges that people writing their content on both sides aren't necessarily very good at preparing um, content that's that's legible, that uh, has real meaning because it's a job spec or whatever. Um, what's changed with the advent of, of using the social media channels? Uh, is it the same people writing content or are we trying to get more professional marketeers involved in, in writing the content that goes out? Uh, I think it's a bit of both. So with social media, now everyone a, is a publisher. Uh, anyone can sign up to Twitter and be publishing in, in, in a couple of minutes, uh, and uh, which means that it's, it's not just uh, marketing coming from the top of an organization, but it's also uh, from, from a, any employee, really. Uh, so that's that. But also, if yep. you look at uh, how uh, buyer, buyer um, behavior nowadays, uh, mm -hmm especially B2B buyers, for instance, they like to check out the company a number of times before they even make an inquiry. They like to go onto a website and look at a blog or check out a video here and there and do their own research before, before they're ready. Um, mm -hmm. so, so companies now are increasingly putting out, their, they're either um, outsourcing it to an agency like, like we do in some cases, mm -hmm. uh, or they have internal marketing people who are almost internal uh, journalists or reporters, if you like, uh, putting mm. out interesting content uh, that's there really to, to attract uh, the right buyers or, or in, in a recruitment context perhaps at the right level of candidates. Mm. But do you see it uh, changing in terms of the type of content? I think one of the uh, uh, examples we hope to talk with you a bit about today is what L'Oreal has done which uh, wasn't necessarily just about recruiting it, it, it per se, it was really this whole thing about how they were in people, they were inspired, they were intellectual, they were in whatever they might be, um, which I think was a brilliant campaign to get people engaged with the organization uh, as opposed to necessarily, oh, I got to send out a job spec. Mm. 
Yeah, so so what uh, Alan's referring to, if you haven't seen it, is uh, uh, L'Oreal, they, um, they just celebrated the fact that they reached 300,000 LinkedIn followers, and they set up a, I guess, a microsite uh, called, I think it's ruin.com, uh, where anyone can go there and log in with your um, uh, LinkedIn profile, and it generates, you, you choose why you're in, why you're, if you're inspired, or what were the other ones in influential, yeah. in, international. Hmm. You chose uh, inter international, I think. I didn't? chose international, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then that then creates a nice image around you. Um, with, yeah, so something, something which makes your profile look good so that you will want to share it in turns onto Facebook, Twitter, and other places. So it's just a, a way of really engaging uh, followers because some companies, you know, rack up a lot of followers, but how do you actually get them interested in what you what you're doing? So that that was a, a really good, um, uh, yeah, I guess user generated content marketing. Mm -hmm. um, I guess in a way it was also similar to I remember what LinkedIn did at the start of, of this year, and when they sent out those, your are you in the top ten percent, top one percent of LinkedIn yeah. members? Yeah. They also they made you look great, uh, and then you were happy to share it with everyone else. So until, you did the, until you did the numbers and realized you were just one of two million. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but 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 that's the power, you know. If you can, if it's yeah. not just coming from from the marketing department, but everyone is sharing it, uh, yeah. that's a lot more powerful, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, how do you see the the changes in this content? going forward, is it going to be more actively involved with these sort of non-recruitment specific campaigns that we saw, for example, with L'Oreal or LinkedIn? Um, do you think that's the wave of the future? Uh, possibly, yeah. I mean, companies, they, I guess they want to create relationships with, with talent over time, and uh, if it's more on the employer branding budget, then you, know, you don't have to uh, get quick wins. You don't need to get 500 applicants by, by next Tuesday. Uh, so it's more about awareness and making sure that everyone knows that L'Oreal uh, uh, provides a thrilling experience uh, for anyone who wants to work there. So, uh, yeah, I, I would say so, for sure. And, and also, it will, it will also inspire perhaps people, perhaps not so much people who want to buy their, um, I don't know, shampoos and things, but uh, anyone who's, uh, who's a partner with them or wants to invest in the company. So it's every stakeholder, really, will be uh, involved as well in and hopefully that they will all be brand ambassadors in the end. Right. So it's an interesting way because you've talked about it being brand ambassadors and, and we're thinking about with the L'Oreal example and others that it's it's about how we get that brand for the organization out to the market and, and to potential candidates. But a lot of our audience today are going to be recruitment agencies. Mm. How, how do they fit into this mix, do you think? Yeah, it's a little, a little bit tougher when you're a recruitment agency. Cause I used to work for one, and I know that you know you, you've got two sales. First, you have to sell to the candidate why should they be interested in your agency, and then you have to sell the job that you've got. When you're when you're L'Oreal, people have already have an idea of who L'Oreal are. Hopefully, uh, so it's a little bit tricky. So I think um, as a recruitment agency, you probably want to uh, start just instilling trust or get, gaining credibility, especially for senior candidates. Mm -hmm. So perhaps candidates have been burnt in the past who uh, uh, don't really trust uh, every, every recruiter on LinkedIn. Um, instead, the, the guys who are, uh, you know, the guys who don't pick up the phone when you call all the time, but when they're ready, they will pick up the phone and ring you and say, okay, now I want to change jobs. So if you can create relationships with those type of people over time, uh, then I think you've done really well. And the way to do that is really to look at uh, what type of content would they be interested in. Uh, so for uh, just uh, an example, so my, my old company, Red Commerce, they put out a lot of information about the SAP world. Um, might, might not be so interesting for, for a lay person, but for someone who is an SAP consultant, cl climbing the ladder in a consultancy, that, that could be really interesting. Um, so white papers, interviews, infographics, all these things. So really seeing seeing the agency as supporting someone to get better at their job, if that makes sense. Isn't, isn't that an integral part of the, the content marketing strategy, Jürgen, though, uh, for a recruiter specifically? Um, if they drift outside of the vertical market that they're looking to establish themselves in, you know, then aren't they at risk of um, um, diluting down the impact that this can have? 
Sure, sure. So uh, it'll work a lot better if you are a specialist uh, recruiter, mm -hmm. uh, like like uh, uh, Red Commerce, if you only do SAP. Uh, if you're someone like uh, Hayes, for instance, uh, you are looking at uh, professionals. So you do professional recruiting. That could be engineering. That could be finance. So I guess it's about looking at what are the common denominators. Yes, you can do a salary survey for finance professionals in Southeast Asia. That's going to be very interesting to them. But what would be interesting to, to, to every professional at that level? Perhaps it's, it's around, I don't know, just uh, career tips, interview tips, um, or the stuff you see on LinkedIn all the time, leadership, how to be a better manager. Uh, so general business tips, perhaps. I think this is an interesting point, I'm sure we were going to get onto this later, is about um, choosing topics that are actually going to engage an audience. One thing I've noticed, certainly on LinkedIn, and I'm connected to a lot of groups on LinkedIn, and I follow a lot of the discussions that are going on there, is that there are topics that are just being regurgitated over and over again. Yeah. And um, I'm almost getting snow blind to some of them, the amount of times that they seem to be churned over. Mm. Can you give us an example? Uh, oh, crikey, there's, there's a whole plethora of different examples. I mean, um, a topic that I'm passionate about myself, which I'm, I'm now reticent to post things on, is, you know, the, the ATS system um, scenario where, you know, how effective is the ATS system at generating direct applications. Um, you know, it's a topic that I'm quite passionate about because we work in the software space ourselves with Smart Recruit. And, um, but I'm seeing so many postings on the topic now that I almost feel like, I'm going to be another person throwing out content about that same topic. But I think the challenge is I would see that with Mark, and Jorgen, you might see this as well, that, uh, you know, you, in fact, you only have to look at the UK Recruiter Forum sometimes, and you see the same question for the last 15 years. You know, what's the best, cheapest, fastest, better, you know, slowest, whatever it might be, ATS that I can use? Um, and it doesn't, almost doesn't matter how many times you or me or Louie or Louise or whoever answers those questions. Next week, next month, there's going to be someone else who wants to know that information, but Ashley hasn't ever really trolled back through the previous conversations on the forums or the groups on LinkedIn or wherever they might be. Mm -hmm. So this, this leads me on to tactics. So if I'm going to write a, a, an article uh, about a particular topic, have you got any tactics that you would suggest how you would complement your article with other efforts that you might deploy within social media and maybe even outside of social media, maybe email as well? Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess regarding writing an article, first, first you might want to ask yourself: Is, is an article the right form of content? Um, but let, let's uh, let's assume it is. Uh, then I would really look at what are the type of questions that our buyers are asking us, or what are the type of questions our candidates have. So it could be that uh, you know, what's the best ATS? So a lot of people are asking that in that forum over and over again. Why not write? Uh, what I would call a, a pillar article, uh, so a really well-written article about what is the best ATS. Write some um, some some examples, some some uh, case studies, perhaps, um, and and make it a really resourceful uh, article with lots of links and so on, and asking questions at the end so that people uh, again start conversation around that. Uh, that will will drive a lot of traffic because you already know that there is an audience out there for it. Uh, however, writing the, the actual article, that, that's only the, uh, the beginning. So once you've got the article written, then the very important bit is uh, just naming it. So it has to have a really catchy title. Because I've seen so many fantastic articles out there with crap titles. And I just, <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I just uh, shed a tear on this for, for whoever's been writing it for a week. And it just goes out and completely bo uh, bombs. Uh, so... A really good title, and then also about how you position position it. So, how is it being launched? Um, you know, obviously you you put it out on Twitter, but are you using the right hashtags? What what groups on LinkedIn might be interested in it? Uh, is everyone in the organisation sharing it? Or are you putting it on the the monthly newsletter? Uh, so yeah, there's, there's, when you write good content, you you have to make sure that it finds an audience as well. Otherwise, uh, you know. It's, it's not that effective. Have you ever come across um, a template that somebody's provided to say this is a good protocol to follow if you're going to deploy a content marketing strategy? You know, so the article, make sure your article is well researched, make sure you
certain things within it. Make sure you put a profile of yourself and your business at the bottom. Maybe consider um, keyword density, and maybe the job title, uh, backlinks, so that you're making sure that you obtain all the benefits. I've never seen anybody that's written a, a temp, you know, a guide. I think that could be quite useful in the marketplace. Yeah, I've I've seen uh, uh, I, a few years ago. I used to look at this uh, this guide, how to write blog post uh, um, uh, titles, so the actual article name, and I was like, I want 101 uh, magic uh, titles, whatever. I used that a lot, uh, mm -hmm. but if that was only that's only one element of it. So yeah, it would be really good to have a checklist of all those bits. I've seen bits and bobs of it, but I haven't seen the you know the ultimate guide to that. So so. Yeah, I mean that's a really good example. That's somebody needs to write that, and whoever writes it will get uh, a lot of downloads from it. Well, only if it works. Now, I appreciate your your technical term for the crap title. Um, <laughs> I've got a couple of questions, and we'll come back to that in a second. But let's start with that title. And everybody that I've read, from you know the social media marketing gurus in the states to recruitment specialists like yourself, always talks about you got to have a great title. It's got to be a catchy title. And no one ever actually then says. Well, what makes a catchy title? Because what I think is catchy, which is, you know, our title for today, you know, um, for example, our content marketing, you know, it can work for recruiters, might not be a catchy title as far as Google search engines or um, other uh, uh, sources of us trying to bring the traffic. So, what what to you makes a catchy title then? Uh, yeah. So. Uh, well, the keywords need to be in there. So, content marketing, recruiting, those will be the keywords. Uh, to, make, to have made this uh, a catcher title today, you could, have, you could have done 10 great ways to content marketing for recruitment. Because then people know what they're going to get, or uh, experts <laughs> on this and that. Mark's uh, so always so having a go at me at my titles. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, or uh, if you're if you're looking more for the for the search angle, then you want to perhaps phrase it as a, as a question. So, how can recruiters use content marketing? Because that's really what people will search for. Right. Um, okay. No, I appreciate that, and I think it's uh, I, I guess it, and it's also it's it's trial and error. Um, sure. And, and are we when we're talking about that catchy title? I guess there's two levels to that. One is it's got to be a title that a Google search or, or I know there are other search engines um, that the Google search brings to the page but then it's got to be catchy enough that I, that I then want to go ahead and click on it because I think it's answering my, my query is that correct? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right, okay. Now when we're talking about content channels, uh, Mark come to you in a second, when we're talking about content channels um, one of our uh, uh, our listeners or viewers has asked, well, what about using SlideShare? How does that fit into this content marketing mix? Uh, yeah, so SlideShare is, is, a, is an interesting one because, uh, well, it was, it was acquired by LinkedIn last year. I think they paid about $100 million for it. And it transpired that but they really they bought SlideShare because they wanted to have a facility to show images on, on LinkedIn, uh, which has worked really well, I think. Uh, but uh, so... It's a different way of, uh, of uh, I guess, um, visual, visualizing content. So as opposed to writing a long article, you can do 10 or 15 slides. Uh, so something a bit more visual, and people respond better to, to visuals. Uh, so that's good. And also, it's, it's embeddable. So, uh, so Alan, if you do a really nice slideshow presentation, then you might have 10 blogs all around the world sticking it on, on, on their sites, right. uh, which, which gives you some traffic back and people will thank you for it on Twitter and so on. And also, if, you are a, uh, if you're a premium user of SlideShare, you can also collect data of who's looking at your uh, presentations. Um, so, you, you know, so some presentations are clean, which you can just go through and, and nothing happens until the final page that says contact us maybe. But some of them are you get two pages and then there's a really annoying pop-up Sometimes you have to enter all your details before you can uh, go go further in the presentation. Sometimes you can just click skip, uh, but those are 
a really good for, for a lot of content marketers use that just to uh, to gain leads really so for instance if you know HubSpot they, they use that all the time LinkedIn themselves all the time I've, I've found that quite uh, useful to all the, uh, the premium as well you have the pop-up um, maybe not right in the middle interrupting you but uh, it, it does allow people to sign up for more content and you can embed it on, on your own LinkedIn profile so it's a, a, yeah. like a little having your own advert there so I suppose recruiters could do that with jobs or perhaps something more exciting than that, but uh, on their own profiles. Absolutely. Did you use it, Louis? I or? do. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we make we we put the slideshare presentations of our products and say bills, white papers, and various um, perhaps uh, you know ten tools or something that Bill's done, and we'll put that on our um our on our own profiles um, and on the sales team and uh, the developers and so forth. So. It's um, LinkedIn's our, our our greatest source really of 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 leads, so um, mm. that's a very useful tool. I'd recommend that to anyone. So. I tell you, what, I'd love to know if anybody has actually created a piece of content specifically to engage with um, an audience that was relevant to a job, and then use SlideShare as a pop up to actually present the job that you're actually really looking to to promote and to see whether they've actually had any success in converting social media traffic into applications by using that technique. Yeah. yeah. You're going to come across anybody doing that before? Sounds I haven't. I've seen the more employee branding decks, which is more about, you know, this is what we're all about. I haven't seen it for specific jobs. Um, and because it takes 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 um, a bit of time to write it up and to make it visually engaging and so on, I wouldn't expect uh, companies to do it for every job, but perhaps if there are more senior positions, that could be a really interesting thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if anyone has an example, please uh, tweet it. We, we've been, we've yeah. been testing video. So we've been creating sort of short videos on Animoto, which is a free tool. Mm -hmm. um, we then export it out, drop it into an editing suite and cut off the Animoto advertising um, and then we're left with a short video which is about the actual job and we've been using that in combination with content, um, especially in sort of LinkedIn groups so that we can get away with writing content about the, the type of job um, so it's not picked up quite so easily by the, the group manager and pushed across into the job section but the video itself actually helps to sell and promote the job and that has converted a few bits of traffic across but um, I'm just wondering whether SlideShare would have the same level of impact or whether that was a quicker or faster way of doing it. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Well, say so Jorgen Madam, um, one of the reasons for bringing SlideShare into the LinkedIn fold because previous to their acquisition you could still use SlideShare but there were the ability to add you know, what you could add other content in those days you could use box you could use other tools and you could mm. upload PDFs and you could add video is it all run through the the slideshare um, link now in order to be able to add that proper content into your LinkedIn profile uh, no so nowadays you can you can add content from um, YouTube Vimeo uh, you can upload PDF documents word documents so so it's really open up uh, so not so many other apps it's more about uh, just really embedding stuff uh, and just putting links in. So that's that's really opened up uh, for for the better, I think. So in terms of content marketing, um, as an individual, that's great. But what about if I'm the recruitment agency again, and I'm thinking about, well, I'm going to be go, you know, I've got a bunch of uh, jobs I want to do for X Y Z Zipper Company. Um, I want to make one of those videos that Mark talked about, or make a slide share that you and Louie work out. Um, mm -hmm. As a recruiter, am I going to put that up on my personal profile? Or do I need to go to like the recruitment agency's company profile? Where should the recruiter be displaying that content? Uh, yeah, so so let's say that you're a recruitment agency. I think, you, first of all, you might want to have one deck or one video, which is more about you, the agency. Um, so why should someone work with your agency? What you know, what are the type of companies you work with? Where are you based? And you know, why are you so fantastic? So so people buy into that. But then there could be another piece of content which is more around uh, specific jobs. And if you're in an agency, there are a lot of jobs come and go all the time, so you probably wouldn't have time <coughs> to create new things for, for every job. But there, there will be a lot of the uh, usual suspects uh, in terms of jobs. So you could basically do a, a deck or a video about we're always looking for uh, good accountants, people who have um, this accreditation uh, for London and Paris and Amsterdam, for instance. And do something a bit more general because obviously, as an agency recruiter, you can't really talk about 
well, you don't really want to give give out the, the client name anyway. So uh, it's more about the, the type of roles they can expect when they speak to you. Uh, but yeah, so to answer your question, um, I, I think that should go on on every recruiter's profile for sure, because the most interactions uh, uh, people will have with your company on LinkedIn will be through uh, your employees' profiles. And from your employees' profiles, they might click back to the company page. So yes, it should certainly go on everyone's profile. Now, that's that's another little uh, quagmire that you can't force people to stick stuff on their profiles, but you can certainly encourage them and show them, you know, why why it will give good results. So, so how does that work with SEO then? If I'm looking for that financial analyst job at XYZ Zipper Company. Um, is that uh, search going to bring up that individual per recruiter's profile because he's got the content in his profile, um, or is it more likely to just go straight back to XYZ Zipper Company? Um, okay, so you're an agency recruiter and you're giving it, giving out the name of your clients. Is that right? uh, yeah, I, I'm a you know as a recruiter, I always believed I'm going to use my clients because that's the attractive bit. Just saying, an unknown manufacturing company has a great job for you. That never worked for me. Um, I believe that you know that the name of the company was part of the attraction why I was going to bring candidates to me. Yeah. Okay. So um, I've never seen, I've never done a, a search, and, and, and individuals coming up. So when you do search for a specific role, uh, instead, the, the, what would come up would be. So let's say you created a SlideShare deck around these jobs. What would come up is the link on SlideShare, so the actual page on SlideShare, which will still bear you know the the link of your agency and your contact details and so on, but it's not going to take you to uh, your LinkedIn profile. Yeah, so uh, I might turn that back around then. So we've just talked about how great it is for the can for the recruiter to be generating some of that content and embedding it in his profile. Um, but that's only good if the candidate happens to look at my profile as a recruiter then. So it's not going to show up in a generic um, so yeah, it, is it? No, it wouldn't. Um, I, I don't believe. I mean, I'm not an SEO expert, but I don't believe so. No. Uh, but I think uh, you know, you look. We look at a lot of uh, profiles every day, all day long, really. And candidates will judge you on, on what's on your profile. And if you've got some interesting jobs happening there, they, they, if they're not interested now, they'll they'll, they'll bear this in mind for future, or they'll tell their friends. Hopefully. Yeah. Mark, how do you um, see the SEO piece work right. with this content? You know, do, do you see that something that's that's helping you when you're trying to drive uh, traffic to your business? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we, we we're creating content on on two levels, aren't we? We're creating interesting content, engaging content that we can use proactively to push out to attract people back to the uh, the, the, the platform where the content is being hosted and to raise your profile. Um, but also while we're writing that content or while we might be getting somebody else to write that content, we can use that uh, as an opportunity to create links back to um, specific pages on our website. Uh, and I'm in interested to hear what Jorgen's thoughts are about the current status quo with regards to backlinking. Um, I, I, I've always used one or two backlinks in my articles to link back to our websites when I'm writing about relevant topics and that was the purpose of me writing the content in the first place and distributing it to other people's uh, blogs and uh, um, you know pu publication online publications mm. um, but recently I ended up in an online debate with somebody who got quite heated who said that uh, anchor texting links into an article was now considered black hat techniques uh, and I disagreed with that and I couldn't find anything um, in Google's own content literature and guidance notes that would agree with that if the content I was writing was relevant, was about me, and the link was relevant to the actual content that was being written. Anything? Yeah, so, so I think that the general answer to that is uh, SEO anchor text is not good and it, you, you will be penalized, both the site that actually has the article and where the link uh, goes to will be will be penalized. So we've had a few issues on the undercover recruiter with this. So people who wrote an article three years ago, they're now coming back to say, can you please remove that link because we've been penalized. So uh, so that's, I think that's an interpretation from uh, SEO experts. But however, I do agree with you. As long as it's, it's relevant and the link isn't really just around the anchor text, but it, it's uh, perhaps just a link to your company. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's something that helps the, the viewer. 
that's how Google see it. it. It enhances the content, then it's absolutely fine. <laughs> this is this is actually something I've been talking about uh, with Alan recently, uh, ironically, and I was saying uh, to Alan I need to re change a couple of press releases on RC Euro because there we, we we used anchor text a couple of years back, and that's now damaging colleagues' uh, rankings. And now I purely use you know the website or anchor it to colleague software. Yeah. I don't anchor any keywords at all. And also with Louise, who isn't here, I'm sorry, we're going off topic here, but with Louise, who isn't here, the, the uh, banner on her website um, it need to, needed to be changed to no follow as well, um, no follow bat links. But that's another, that's another hangout, perhaps. But, um, well, it is, it is yeah. all relevant because, you know, you have to have an objective to be able to justify putting the time aside to in, uh, researching and putting together a decent piece of content. And what we want to be able to do, if we're going to justify this uh, time and effort, is to get the maximum amount of benefits from it. So one of them is to raise your profile and to push your content in front of relevant people, which might say, hey, I'm a go-to person for this space, as Jürgen's guys did with, in the SAP arena. But, but also, we want to try and derive benefits for, 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 for the website. And um, I mean, my, my recent article that got picked up was an article about um, applicant tracking type software. Uh, it was about the, 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 the latest versions of that and what they do and what they're trying to achieve and how they're overcoming some of the problems. And as part of that, I anchor text a, a link for um, digital online recruitment software back to our website. Now, I have struggled to find anything that is written either by Google, by a Google expert. You know, we're talking about with these experts that are genuine experts that can confirm that what I was doing was actually damaging and not beneficial. Um, and it is an anomaly at the moment. A few people are able to answer the question. I was hoping that you might have some insights on this. And, and, and maybe just to help that, Jorgen and, and Mark, for some of our listeners and viewers who might not understand what we mean when we say anchor text, um, what do you actually mean by that? Because normally you you read a blog article and it says Louis welcome and it'll, and it'll be high, it'll be hyperlinked back to his Google Plus or his LinkedIn profile of colleague software that'll go back to the colleague software web page is going to talk about recruitment app you know recruitment software and there, that word recruitment software might also be linked back to colleague. Is that the one that's actually the pro the problem? Yes, so it's recruitment software. So basically, so the idea there is that a lot of people would search for recruitment software in Google, but they won't search for colleague because they don't know a colleague is a provider of this. Um, so that that has historically been been the way to do it. But now with, I mean, Google has changed their algorithm a lot in the last year or two, mm. and they've introduced a lot more uh, social signals in there instead. So uh, so kind of endorsements and saying. Okay, so Alan Whitford shared his article. That, therefore, we think uh, it's it's slightly more credible now. Uh, so more and more people are sharing it. Yeah, it's, it's gaining credibility. So so it's not just about these backlinks anymore. But uh, yeah, I mean, I I don't know exactly, and I, I wouldn't want to uh, say exactly how it is on on these uh, backlinks. But um, that that's basically how we've done it. We've we've removed any uh, any of these anchor text backlinks. Because that's the advice we've been given. So uh, you you may Mark, you may want to see if if it's damaged your uh, um, page rank and your authority. Well, in truth, we have seen a a a, a, um, a backward step in our page rank uh, from right. the experts. And um, I, I would like to know what what are the tools that we can use and what can anybody else use to do a search to find out what backlinks are out there and what impact they're having because I mean I've tried looking on using various tools and, mm. <laughs> and given, uh, given that we run a content marketing platform and we're pretty pushing out hundreds of articles I suppose I should really know but it just goes to show that even people who are dedicated to doing this type of activity you know we don't know all the answers yeah, so Mark, I'm, I'm currently going through every backlink from my Google Keywords tool, and I've found 1,700 bat links to colleague.eu, and I'm going through each one, <laughs> I'm trying to work out whether it's good or bad. Um, it, it, it's not an easy. It, Google don't make it um, don't make it easy, really, do they? Yes, yeah, so um, I think Google Webmaster Tools will tell you, and I think uh, used to be Yahoo Site Explorer will tell you as well, and I think there's even something called Backlinkchecker.com or, or similar to that. Uh, so, 
you, you, you will be able to find it, and then it's just a case of manually going through and looking at these and, and asking the webmaster to say, oh, can you move our link, can you move it from software provider uh, to F10, for instance? And they, they normally happily do that. So, so if we've got any listeners out there who uh, are really deep and dark into these secrets and want to share their knowledge with us, uh, put a tweet up on the uh, hashtag Rec Hangout um, or pop uh, Louis or Mark a, a note. And, and as Louis said, this might be worth a, a short hangout for those uh, you know, people that are deeply intent. Yeah. Yep. If people are interested um, you know, in this, get Darren Ravel on. Um, he, he's quite knowledgeable in this area. He's yeah. somebody I've had a few conversations with. Yeah. Probably even tuned in today. Yeah. Hey, so I think he's watching. Sure. It's, they're quite Is quiet he? today, everyone. Don't be so yeah. quiet. Ask some questions. <laughs> so that, that brings us almost full circle then, Jor Jorgen. Uh, if, um, if we're talking about building content in, in almost any article that you might have read from looking at Google, which is how to write great content, it'll pull up tons of articles from the last three or four years, and all of them are going to talk about backlinks or make sure that you link to back to your page or you, you do all that stuff. So we've got a bunch of people out there that are now wanting to write content, um, thinking that what I have to do is, is litter it full of hyperlinks to make sure everybody comes back to my profile or back to my site. And what we're really saying now is that's fine as long as it always says Louis or Mark or Alan or Link Humans or Tira or whatever to go back to that site. But anything that doesn't actually belong on that site is a problem for, our, for, for generating content. That's our sort of nutshell um, conclusion of that. That's the interpretation du jour, but uh, yeah, we, we can't confirm it 100%, only Google no. can do that. So what's your advice then uh, to people that are starting to, starting that journey of writing new or better content then? Um, mm -hmm. is, to just, is it to lessen the amount of links and go more, as Louis said, for shares? Um, you know, but how do we generate shares? Do we some, have to put that somewhere in our text, which is if we really want to help us share this with somebody and use these various... Uh, you know, share buttons that you'll find on my site. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can definitely, uh, you should have sharing buttons even you know, above and below the post, I think. Uh, so make it easy for people to share. Uh, and also some so some articles you'll find in the middle of an article, it's, uh, you know, a particular quote will be, will be written down and they'll say, tweet this. So if you click there, you tweet exactly that uh, quote uh, with the link back to, to the article. So that's kind of a, 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 a tweet bait, if you like, so right. a, a nice little chunk. And, and uh, yeah, absolutely, it's, uh, so it's about creating the content, but then also having the audience and making sure that it reaches the right people, having those uh, relationships with people. Uh, so some people I know, they, they'll write an article and they'll, they'll email it to 50 people. Um, to say, you know, what do you think of this? Or others will just uh, tweet it on a specific hashtag or put it in a LinkedIn group. But just making sure that uh, and everyone that's intended for actually sees it. And then you can't force people to, to uh, retweet and share and so on. But just make sure that they at least see it somewhere on their feed. And then it's up to them if they want to share it. If it's on uh, uh, quality uh, um, content, they will do. Well, I think you're right, and, and I think the, the difference we have now, the one I started blogging and Peter Gold started blogging a few years ago, was then you kind of wrote an article and no one would ever comment on it um, because they had to log into WordPress or TypePad or whatever platform we were using at the time and then make their comments. So nobody did, and you felt like you were it was the tree falling in the forest and no one heard it, um, <laughs> yeah. whereas now with the social share buttons, it, it, even if the content's uh, and the comments are not showing up on the blog itself. We're seeing them in the other media channels, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, people are very keen on uh, commenting on your blog or uh, on Twitter. Sometimes you feel like, okay, well, why can't you just write that comment on my blog so everyone can see? Uh, but uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's certainly the case. Yeah, Louis, how do you see it? Uh, you know, because you you do a lot of blogging and put a lot of content out. Are you finding people commenting on the blogs themselves, or are they you commenting on on Twitter or Facebook or another channel? Um, we don't get many comments on the blog itself. It's mainly uh, on LinkedIn, on, on where we're sharing it to, or on Twitter. Um, uh, yeah, on the channels you're sharing it out for, uh, through, and that's where the discussions are taking place. That's where we're, we're finding out who's reading. Um, 
we uh, I mean, one of the one of the questions I wanted to get Jorgen's sort of input on was the the sort of whole process between the marketing and and the consultants and the generation of leads and relationship building over a long time if that makes sense. I mean, for a while uh, when I joined Colleague, we did a lot of blogging and um, just pushing articles out and so forth, just. Uh, building brand awareness, you can say, and and now we're really starting to link that back to um, to white papers and webinars and things that people can sign up to on the website, and then those those are going into a sales cycle um, after that. So it's starting to all come together a bit more to uh, to eventually lead um, to hopefully to uh, generating customers. Um, but do do you have do you go into do do you find you have to sort of Go through that with with the people you work for uh, with. Do you come up with strat long term strategies like that? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's uh, uh, there are different types of content. So there's a short and long long term content, long yeah. uh, long form content. So the shorter content will be your updates and so on. It might be just a, a blog post. It might be uh, Vine videos, six, six second videos, uh, or an Instagram video. So that's quick and, and easily uh, produced. But then the longer form content. So uh, this Google Hangout, for instance, you had a, you had a sign up page today, uh, which um, which basically may, means you you capture email addresses. Uh, also for white papers, um, podcasts. I'm thinking uh, this type of webinars and so on. Uh, when you're offering that uh, uh, white paper uh, ebooks, for instance, when you're offering a bit more content, something that's got more of a monetary value to it. Then people are happy to exchange their email to get this for free, uh, and that's really, I guess, the essence of content marketing uh, in terms of, of gaining leads. Um, so that's how a lot of technology companies are doing it, and that's really the inbound marketing methodology uh, that, for instance, HubSpot uh, preach. So, so yeah, yeah. For sure. It, it really depends on. I think it depends on the the um, what type of product you're selling, what type of service you're selling. What is it that you want? Do you want page views on the site, uh, or do you actually want, or do you only need to hit 10 email addresses per month because uh, they're really high-level buyers? Uh, so, so the, the well, number, for, for CRMs, it's, of course, a very long, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very it's long uh, sales process. Ticket, but, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, um, but with recruit, do you think that kind of inbound uh, marketing would work well with recruiters, niche recruiters? Um, it, for clients, yes, but not for candidates. So the candidate yeah. is more that they're just out browsing or they happen to stumble, stumble across something. A candidate is, is unlikely to want to sign up to a recruitment agency's newsletter uh, and get a you know monthly or weekly newsletter uh, when they're not interested in jobs, unless that you know there's some fantastic content coming out of there, which is not really about jobs. They could create something, I suppose, like your like you've done with the undercover recruiter, where you focus. Um, uh, just on that niche, uh, and if for some niche agencies, that might interest uh, both the candidate and the client. Say something on, um, I don't know, you could be the ga uh, computer games industry, they could have a, a blog f purely focused on, on good content for that, or something like that, that both sides would be interested in. Isn't, isn't yeah, this, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Isn't this important that, um, you know, if, if you don't want to be perceived as the recruiter stalking the candidate, then you need to disguise yourself as uh, the distributor of uh, relevant and interesting content um, and potentially set up a, uh, a blog that is not easily identifiable as I'm a recruiter just looking to try and gather all your information in. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I think it's a more of a soft sell approach and people like to do their research before they uh, instead of being sold to, um, so yeah, for sure, and it, it is sales support as well. So when when your young new uh, recruiters start making phone calls, ideally the, the person they speak to on the other side of the line, they'll say, "Oh yeah, I saw an article from your company," or "Yeah, I really appreciate that those uh, what to wear to an interview tips that was on your blog last week." Uh, so, so it kind of helps helps those uh, cold calls. I mean, for example, we, we use Ask the Experts as our social media content marketing type platform. We use that as our, as our hub for hosting our content and then distribute it from there. We can also break that content down into sections and samples and quotes 
and push them out as tweets. So we try and regurgitate and utilize the content that's been generated, if it's any good, to, to maximize its potential. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's a great way of doing it. So something we haven't talked about is uh, recycling content. So uh, let's say there's an article you wrote three years ago, which uh, is still getting a lot of traffic, maybe about ATS systems or whatever. Uh, that that can then be used um, to, to create a slide share deck with the exact same information, but now visualized. Or it could be a video, or you could do a short uh, a podcast around it. Uh, so using the same content which, which you know there is an audience for, uh, and just recycling it, and or just uh, tweeting out by title quotes like, like you mentioned, them. Mm -hmm. so. so you mean all of that content that I wrote about why is there air um, all those years ago? I should recycle and bring them back then into the uh, into the recruitment flow. Um, but well, let me ask you a question. I, I know I've written a lot of strange articles, um, but what about is the strength of the content itself sufficient? And this is a question from one of our uh, one of our viewers: uh, Is the strength of the content on its own sufficient, or the, the the individuals themselves need to also think about their LinkedIn profile or their other social profiles to back up their credentials, so that if the reader, you know, in order that the reader actually takes them seriously, um, but, you know, there's there's great content. Actually, depend on the author. I, th I think it's a it's a bit of both. So sometimes uh, there is a fantastic article written by someone who barely has a social media profile. Uh, that happens once a month. Uh, but typically, it will be the, the known people and people who are have the right profiles here and there. Uh, so that certainly helps. Also, now with with uh, with Google Plus and the authorship um, uh, the authorship links. So uh, if if uh, if Alan writes an article about air and uh, and you yeah. you uh, air and yeah, you link yeah. link it properly uh, to your Google Plus profile, then that will then be ranked better in Google searches because because of your authority on Google Plus as well. Um, and I don't know if if uh, Google take other social accounts into uh, consideration, but I wouldn't be surprised if they did. If they rank that better because you have X number of followers on Twitter as well, so absolutely, it, it can only help. So the authority of the of the author on whatever the topic is definitely will help on the content. So it's not just about sitting down one day and going, I'm going to start this thing now and I'm going to write great content. If if you have to have an audience to start following and build that up on a regular basis. Yeah, I mean they, they, it's a hen or hen chicken or the egg. Uh, basically, you know, where, where does it start? It goes hand in hand, I suppose. But uh, I mean, just an example. Look at uh, Seth Godin. Do you ever read his his blog? Yeah. Uh, I mean, he gets away with writing two sentences and then having 400 retweets because it's Seth Godin. It's seen as wow, this is fantastic content. Mm. But if, if someone just starts books. starts out, does that? It's not going to write ten gonna... books that sold over a million copies first, mind you, Jürgen. Fair play, fair play. <laughs> but he, he does blog every day, and sometimes I think like you didn't have to put that blog out. You could have just tweeted that, for instance. Okay, he's not on Twitter, but uh, you get the point. So uh, if you have that uh, credibility, then mm -hmm. sure you can get away with. Uh, we things. did we did sort of touch on a subject earlier. I'm now conscious that we're sort of running up to the end of the hour. Um, because there's a lot of people out there that want to use content marketing to sort of, you know, uh, get gain some exposure and uh, you know strengthen their personal brand, and um, they may not be the best journalists in the world. Um, you mentioned earlier about sort of, you know, top tips and things like that. From our experience, actually, the this type of content mm. gets more videos than the, the the you know the full-on article itself. So, which type of content gets more? The, the, the top tips type content tends yeah. to get more visits, uh, more clicks through to those articles, unique visitors, than uh, you know a full-on article, which is a tem generally tends to turn into an opinion piece. Sure, uh, and I think that really depends on what you again what you're looking at. Is it do, do you want quantity of people coming onto your site? Mm -hmm. Then go for the uh, uh, for you know, the, the Sun type of content, the Daily Mail type of content, uh, so the tabloid stuff. That's going to drive a lot of traffic. But if you're if you're looking for those B two B buyers or the senior candidates, then you're going to have to go more Telegraph type of content, mm -hmm. so long form, uh, really in depth type of stuff. That's what they will be impressed with. But these are the people that perhaps might read McKinsey reports every day. They are not going to be impressed by five ways to pimp your LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's about knowing your audience there. 
Absolutely. All right. No, I appreciate that. And as Mark said, we're, we're getting near to the end of the hour. So, Jorgen, is there anything that we haven't touched on yet around the, this, this um, topic that we that we talked about? We'd like to get out there and into the uh, into the. Uh, uh, yeah. Minds? So I just wrote down a note uh, in terms of you know, so, so we talked about creating content. Uh, Obviously, as a as a recruiter, or you know, if you're a frontline recruiter yourself, you you probably not you probably won't won't have that much time to create content. Uh, you know, your your uh, sales managers breathing down your neck and saying you should be on the phone instead. So another way of doing it is, of course, to curate content to to find other snippets of content from different places and sharing them, and then being seen as someone who, who, who continuously comes up with, with finds good information. And it doesn't really have to, to take much of your time. So if you set, set aside maybe 10 or 15 minutes in the morning, looking at perhaps um, uh, Twitter, you can look at RSS readers. So Feedly is a really good tool. Uh, using LinkedIn today, or it's now known as Pulse. Uh, other tools like Flipboard or Google Alerts, uh, which you can have set up for certain keywords. That way you can find a lot of content. Uh, then you can use the other tools, which are scheduling tools. So for instance, Buffer or Hootsuite or TweetDeck, and you can set these uh, updates to go out throughout the day or throughout the week. Mm. And you can then you know, forget about social media, check, check in at lunchtime, whatever, uh, but you're still out there pushing out content without really have, having to create it. Feed, All right. feed, now, leaf, feed leaf plus buffer, just great combination. Yeah. I, I like the two tools. And you can, of course, do it for multiple uh, individuals. It might be cheating a bit, but um, uh, it, it's not social uh, media purity. But, um, but you know, a marketing person can distribute it through, through a team, or you can have a team advocate doing it. for. So we've got John, the developer, downstairs, and he, he uh, buffers on behalf of the of, of that team. So. So does that lead us to what, what, what Bernadette, one of our viewers, has asked us, though? Do you encourage one voice for an organization or multiple voices? I would definitely encourage both. So, so one voice from, from, from the one official voice, for sure, mm -hmm. but then you'd want everyone else, ideally, to be sharing the content, but perhaps adding their own little spin to it and saying, oh, yeah, this is an interesting piece from my CEO, and I really like this and that, and so so yes, yeah, so if you can engage your employees to, to be the ambassadors or any other stakeholder, then that is so much more powerful than uh, you know just being one official feed coming out. Yeah, little, Mark, you had a question. Yeah, a little tactic I spotted, um, uh, and I've used it myself, and we've tried to use it through the Tira group, um, especially on LinkedIn. Um, not many people actually log into LinkedIn to read the articles. What they tend to do, most of the activity on LinkedIn with regards to content comes through the weekly summary reports that get sent out and then what people do is they skim through the headings and then click on the ones that they're interested in to visit and read them. So um, getting your, your content to be at the top of that list is determined by the amount of comments that have been placed against the, the article and also the number of likes. So if you can get a group of you to support each other and you post an article onto LinkedIn post it round to them so they all go and post a comment on it to get it up and running. You only really need a couple of comments on there and you'll actually be right at the top of that weekly summary list. And then if somebody posts another comment the second week, you're actually back in the list again, so you're actually extending out the, the mm. benefits of that, of that content. And I know it's a bit manufactured, but I've seen recruiters doing it where actually the people in the same company are the ones commenting just to keep it at the top of the list. Uh, that takes us back to job board, refresh your job post every 25-minute days, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> uh, a final question, Jorgen, as, as we reach the end of the hour. Um, I'm creating this great content. How do I decide where to put it? Should I just be writing my own blog or, you know, stick it up on LinkedIn or, you know, look for some industry publications? How do I decide where I want that content to show up? Uh, okay, so that depends on what your what platform you've got. So, have you got a, a blog with which has a lot of traffic already, which you know a lot of people subscribe to? Then I would suggest doing it there. Because typically, it's best to put it on your own site because then you can gain the SEO. However, if you want the maximum impact of it, then perhaps pitch it to to some other bigger blogs out there uh, who can give you an audience straight away. Uh, you get a limited SEO benefit in, in terms of uh, the link. 
but uh, you, instead you might get more exposure. Uh, but, but on LinkedIn, certainly you always share it into LinkedIn. You can't really blog on LinkedIn, so, uh, or Facebook or Twitter, not, not long format anyway. So th th those are places to share, really. On the sharing option, what, what are your thoughts on social share for LinkedIn? So, you know, for example, if I write an article and I'm a member of 25 different recruitment groups, should I post it into all those groups using social share? Is there a downside to doing that? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it is kind of anyone that runs a LinkedIn group will know that it's a bit like uh, the drive-by networking. So someone that drops in the same piece of content into 25 groups, uh, it's not... As long as it's relevant and you, you think it will help people in the group, I think it's fine. Uh, so I rarely do that myself nowadays. Maybe a few years ago I would have dropped into 50 groups just to get a lot of page views. Uh, but now I try, tend to be a bit more careful because uh, there's also this um, site-wide um, uh, moderation in, in a LinkedIn group. So if one LinkedIn group um, manager puts you out as a spammer, then you will automatically uh, go into the um, moderation queue for yeah. all your updates in, in all other groups. So it's be a little bit careful. Hmm. It did. Yeah. 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 So I, I just like to say, so we, we, we could do an we could do an entire session on SWAM and don't get me started on it. Um, you know. <laughs> what does it stand for? Site wide. Site wide automatic moderation. That's it. Yes. Yeah, in other words, you're stuffed because somebody didn't like you, um, and that's the technical term that they might use for it. Um, I'd just like to say a quick uh, shout-out, by the way, to, I think, the listener probably coming from the furthest away, Susan Wright Boucher, or Boucher, I'm not quite sure how you say that, Susan, so sorry if I got it wrong, who's, who's been sending comments in all the way from Vancouver, Canada. So uh, we, we've got, I think she wins the prize for the uh, the furthest reach today. Um, Jorgen, it's been great. I think we could probably go another two or three hours with you, but I appreciate you sharing the content and uh, and the good work that you've been doing there. Um, Pleasure. Mark, you know, brilliant questioning as, as, as usual, and Louis, uh, brilliantly for keeping us all together one more time. Um, Thank I you, think Mike. it's been, you know, look forward to seeing people back in two weeks. Louis, what's our topic in two weeks' time? Two weeks we've got uh, Martin Lee, 11th of December, why and how can effective recruitment research help your business? Question Louis, mark. Louis, have we got a prize this week for, um, for the best location for Alan's uh, live commentary from his sauna? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys, you just, I, I personally I like uh, how the coat is growing out of Jorgen's head, so I think that's even better. You know. <laughs> um, uh, Oh Thank yeah, you, it's a one. It's one o'clock now, isn't it, Alan? We changed to one p.m. in future. Okay. We should oh, mention well. that. Um, uh, uh, from now, on, most of the hangouts we were clashing with social talents webinars, uh, Johnny Campbell, and uh, we thought we don't want to fight uh, over uh, viewers. So um, one p.m. now. Okay, so we'll see all your listeners again in two weeks. Thank you, and people like Miguel out there who was trying to comment, but he was on the road and didn't have a good enough connection. Um, look forward to uh, the follow-up comments as well. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jorgen. Thanks, all. Thank Take care. Bye-bye.